Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, this is Greg Fritz, and I've got good news for you. Welcome to today's program. Today we're going to take you into a live service that we recorded earlier, and I know you're going to enjoy this message. As you know, good-hearted, well-meaning Christian people can ruin their prayer lives by getting in the presence of God and constantly rehearsing all their mistakes. God doesn't even know what you're talking about. What is it in us that, that compels us to remind God of all of our failures? I, God's already dealt with it. Maybe you haven't, but he has. And those sins are not being counted against you. If he's going to forget it, I'm going to forget it. It's, it's not there. It's not on record. He said, I'll remember them no more. Quit ruining your prayer life. Quit ruining your life by remembering things that are not on the record any longer. He wiped it out. He wiped it away. Can you accept that? You know, I, I know the problem with this. People are so acquainted with what they've done. You know it frontward and backward and inside out. And maybe you're a, a repeat offender. And that adds to the compounding feeling of guilt that you live with. But let me tell you something, and I'm not here to belittle sin. Quite the contrary. Sin's terrible. You're terrible for doing what you did. Shame on you. <laughs> you shouldn't have done it. Sin's awful. We all ought to go to hell forever. We should never be able to go back into the presence of God after what we've done. But I don't want to talk about what we've done right now. If you read the New Testament, that's not mentioned that much. What we want to talk about here is what he did. And let me tell you something. There's more value in one drop of that holy, spotless blood than you can even imagine. And he shed his blood to forgive you of your sins. And I don't know what you've done. It may be a mountain of guilt in your past, but the blood of Jesus is enough. The value of his blood was enough. The sacrifice that he gave is priceless. And he gave it for us once, for all, forever. Accept what he did. Put value on what he did. Put value on the sacrifice that was made for you for the remission of your sins. Isn't that a great thought? says, your sins and your lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Years ago, I was trying to get in car insurance. I thought my insurance was a little high, and so I was shopping. I'd been traveling for a few years at that time. And back in those days, 20-some years ago, I drove to a lot of my meetings. And you drive, I don't know, I'm not... I guess I am making an excuse, but when you drive through multiple states and multiple towns, I'm not, I don't have a problem on the interstate. It's just going into these towns. It goes from 65 to 40. And if you take your eye off the ball, you're tired, you've been driving all day, they can get you. And so anyway, I, um, that's my excuse. <laughs> so I had tickets. I mean, I had, I think I probably had tickets in four or five states. I was kind of proud. Anyway, um, uh, I uh, applied for new insurance and, they, and the first thing they asked you, and I didn't know this, the thir first thing they said back then was, do you have any tickets? And I said, yeah, how many do you want? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I said, no, do you have, uh, I said, well, yeah, I got tickets. How many? I don't know, several. And they says, well, if you got tickets, you're, we're not going to accept you. And I said, oh, man. So I called three or four companies, same thing. I mean, I had tickets in Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, all the states around Oklahoma. I didn't have any in Oklahoma. But anyway, I went to the, I finally got tired. I thought, well, no, I'm just going to go to the driver, the, the, the Department of Motor Vehicles and just, and just see what's on my record. 
So for five dollars back then, they would do a they would do a search and the, and they searched my records. And I you know I'd like to know how many tickets are on my record. And so they did a search and they said none. We've looked at all your records, and you don't have any tickets on your record. And I said. <laughs> Evidently, the states just didn't report to one another. So I got back on the phone and called the insurance company and said, I would like driver's insurance. Do you have any tickets? I said, absolutely no tickets on my record. None. I have no tickets on my record. You can check it yourself. I'll give you $5. You can check my record. I just checked it. Go ahead. Look. No tickets. Well, listen, if, if the state of Oklahoma is going to ignore all that evidence against me, I'm going to. <laughs> Why should I remind them? <laughs> you know, they wouldn't accept my, my verbal testimony anyway. They'd go back to the record and they'd say, there's nothing here. I'm sorry, sir. You're misinformed. There's no ticket on your record. If you went, on tri if you went to trial and you were accused of some crime and the judge said, not guilty, you wouldn't say, objection. <laughs> I, I know maybe I won't get prison time, but I really did do a few things that I would like the court to go. No, you'd just go, thank you, sir, and out you'd go. Would you not? Then why do we do this with God? Why do we want to remind God? Why do we want to build a case against ourselves? I'll tell you why. There is one who's called the accuser of the brethren, and he will accuse you to God, and he'll accuse you to your friends, and he'll certainly accuse you to your family, and he'll accuse you to yourself. Don't accept it. You need to stand your ground and say, the, the record against me is not guilty. The judge has already ruled in my favor. I am acquitted. I am not guilty. I am sinless. I don't care what you think you saw. I don't care what you think you know. I said I'm not guilty. And if God's not going to call me guilty, I'm not going to call myself guilty. Amen. Then you go on to verse 18. Now where there is remission of these... Now, we're moving on to Hebrews 10, 18. Now, where there is remission of these, that would be sins. How many of you have received remission of your sins? All right, this is important, an important point. Where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. <sighs> Did you hear that? He forgave you. Your sins have been remitted. They've been canceled out. No more sin. So there's no more offering for sin. You can't add what you did to what he did. You can't add what you want to pay to what he paid. It's paid for. It's over. Move on. Move on away. Don't go back there. Don't try to pay for what he did. You can't pay for it with tears. You can't pay for it with grief. You can't pay for it with sorrow. There's not a certain length of time that you need to mourn your past mistakes. He paid for it. You couldn't pay for it anyway. All the tears that you could ever offer were wouldn't pay for your sin. None of your blood would pay for your sin. None of your repenting could ever pay for your sin. You need to accept what he did and you need to move on. And I'll tell you some people, it's pride. It's just pride. They're elevating their importance and, and, and to a place where it doesn't belong. If God wants to forgive you of all your sins forever, your job is to say, thank you. Now, I, I go to lunch with different people around here. I've been to lunch with Gary Lukey many times. I'm going to go to lunch with Mike Davis today. And Billy Epperhart, I think. We're trying to capture him. If Billy, which he will today, pay for my lunch. Is Billy, is Billy paying? Billy's paying for our lunch. And we're sitting around the table at a nice, we're going to a nice, nice restaurant. And we all get the most expensive thing on the menu. And the, and the waiter comes and takes the check and takes Billy's money and pays and cancels out the check. 
wouldn't it be, it, it would be unseemly. It would be impolite. It would be out of place for me to say, wait a minute, waiter, I, I, I need to pay for my meal. I mean, I ate here. I don't pay, for, I don't eat where I don't pay. Listen, I'm going to pay for my meal. In fact, I'm not worthy to eat at a place like this and fall on the floor and say, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I feel so guilty. I've eaten your food. I, I, I want to at least pay some of the bill. Could you please? It would embarrass everybody in the picture. The waiter can't do anything about it because the bill's paid. You can't pay a bill if it's already paid. It's over. It's, it's done. The books are closed. You can't go back and redo it. The best thing I could do is quit crying and rolling around on the floor and, and confessing how unworthy I am to everybody and get up and put your coat on and say, thank you. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Too many Christians, the, the price has been paid. Jesus did it. You can't add to what he did. I don't care how bad you feel about it. That doesn't add to what he did. I don't care how much it hurts you that you failed. It doesn't add to the price that he's already paid. That's done. It's over. The best thing you can do is stand up, put your coat on, thank him for what he's done, and march out into the future with confidence as a forgiven cleansed, purified, sanctified child of God. Can you see how much time people waste? And a lot of it is trying to add to what he did. I'm going to read it again. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Nothing more you could do about it. Nothing more you can add to it. It's over. It's not my words. These are the words of Jesus and the word, the word of God, the words of Hebrews. God wrote these words that we could have confidence that he applied his blood for the remission of our sins. You're forgiven today. I, I suggest you just take it. Well, bless God, nobody's ever given me anything. I work for what I get. You can't work for this. You'll do without forever and ever and ever until you learn how to accept the free gift that God's giving through salvation. You have to accept that. You just have to be like, that's why Jesus said, except you become like a little child, you won't enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because adults are used to earning their way, but you can't earn this. I'm glad God didn't wait till we could pay for it. We'd have never paid. We'd have never been able to do it. Colossians 2.14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. I'm glad he did that. Jesus did for us what we could never do for ourselves. I'm glad he did. I want to read a couple of different translations or paraphrases to this verse. Again, this is King James, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. In one paraphrase, it says, God crossed out the whole debt against us in his account books. Did you know God's got books? The dead will be judged by the things written in those books, but not you. Evidently, heaven keeps really great records, but your records have been crossed out. He no longer counted the laws we had broken. He nailed the account book to the cross and closed the account. I'll take that. Plain English Bible says, He destroyed the record of debts that was standing against us. He nailed it to the cross and he put it out of sight. Let it go. You're not being humble by feeling guilty. You're not showing your appreciation to God by feeling guilty. There's no room in the life of the New Testament believer, the laborer for Christ. There's no room for guilt and shame. There's no room for that. You need to let Jesus eradicate that. Let the Word of God drive it out. We can live with no regrets. Here's another one. Romans 8, verse 33. I like this. 
Paul said, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, and is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Isn't that a powerful argument? He's, he's saying this, all those who feel guilty, all those who have this sense. Listen, there are Christians that have a sense of condemnation and they don't even know why. There are Christians that just have a sense of guilt and inferiority that just follows them around all their life and they don't even realize that they have and they don't know why. And so Paul's saying, hey, who is condemning you? Where do you get this sense of condemnation? It's not from God. He justified you. You think God did a good job? Do you think he did a halfway job on you? You think he did it completely? Of course. Then you're speaking against the work of God. If you're going to act like you're guilty and he says you're justified, who's right? Well, I'm going to choose God. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died, rather that's already risen and is at the right hand of God who always lives to make intercession. So what he's saying is, look, God Almighty is not condemning you. Jesus, his only son, is not condemning you. He's praying for you. God justified you. Jesus died for you. Now he's praying for you. There's no condemnation coming from that part of the universe or that part of justice. So where is it coming from? Well, I'll answer that. Condemnation comes from the devil. He's the accuser of the brethren. Condemnation comes from your own mind because you remember your past. And sometimes that plays a, a, a part in condemnation in your life. You, you, but you know what? Your mind is no match for the justification that comes from God through Jesus Christ. Your memory cannot override what God has done for you in Christ. You need to submit your memory, submit your thinking to the Word of God. You are justified. It's important for you to know that. It's important for you to believe that, for you to do what God has for you to do in the days to come. You've got to leave guilt and shame behind. You've got to say goodbye to the, to, to the connection you had with your past and, and move forward. Another area of condemnation would be from your own relatives. How many of you know your relatives will condemn you? Yeah, you go home for holidays and they'll go, you were in Bible school, huh? You a Jesus person now. You got a Bible, huh? I know you. You're not fooling me. I know where you came from. I know what you've done. I know who you are. No, you don't. You see, the, my case has been tried and I've been found not guilty. The Father God, He's the God, the Supreme Court of the universe has tried my case and declared I'm not guilty. I have a paraphrase for you if you'd like to hear this. I think it's very inspiring. And it's on this verse, on these verses, Romans 8, 33 through 34. This is Carpenter's paraphrase. And I think you could still find these maybe if you were to look them up. They're, they're only on just a few books. They're very small, but, but it's quite um, graphic. And they've taken a lot of liberties that I think are, are neat. Anyway, it says this in Carpenter paraphrase. It says, we are the people of his covenant, citizens of his charter, sons of his compassion. Let the accuser launch his charges. They will fall harmless to the ground. The judge of all the world has set our feet upon the way of righteousness. And there's no other court that can reverse that verdict. Think of Christ crucified. Remember that the crucified is now risen. He's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. It is his voice that says all the time, Father, remember those for whom I died. That precious death, that mighty resurrection, that glorious ascension, that good shepherdly pleading at the right hand of God, that marvelous series of creative acts has forged a union that cannot be broken. The love of Christ has gathered us and no power save that of our own defiant will can tear us from his keeping. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Now I wanna give you a couple other thoughts in a practical sense. Turn to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 35. And this will be for all of those who feel like they've 
Maybe they've had such a past that they just feel like they'll never, ever be able to do what God originally wanted them to do. And as I said before, God doesn't have any has-beens. There's no such thing as what it could have been or should have been. There's always a future with God. And in Daniel 11.35, for those of you that just really have a vivid memory of your past mistakes, listen to this word. Daniel 11.35, some of those of understanding shall fall. God knew it. God said it. God saw that it would happen. Those of understanding, they knew better. They were educated in the things of God and they did wrong. They went off the end of the, you know, they went off the wagon. They went off the deep end. They fell. But notice how God can take even that and turn it around to refine them, to purify them, and make them white until the time of the end because it's still for the appointed time. Don't ever give up on your dreams. Don't ever give up on God's plan for your life because God is so good at what he does. He can even take your failures and turn them into qualifiers for your future. There are certain things in your life today that you're completely immune from because you've been there. You saw the end result. There's no more mystery around that. You've, you've suffered for it and you've learned from it. And what he's saying is those that fell, God will cause that to refine them. They're not finished. They're, it's not over with. God didn't wash the, his hands of them. He didn't tell them, go sit on the bench. He didn't say, now you're going to have to take plan B. No, it's always plan A with God because he is a master at bringing plan A to pass. Even your mistakes refine you and purify you and make you white until the time of the end. Because it's still for the appointed time. What does that mean? The mission's still on. Plan A is still in effect. God still has a plan for your life. And as I said before, God can do more with your future than you could if you went back and redid your past. Forget it. It's over. Move on. I got to give you one more example that I got this week in prayer, and it just blessed me so much. But I thought of Peter in John 21 and verse 15. This is when Jesus met the disciples at the lake, the Sea of Galilee, and they were, they were fishing and they got together on the bank and they were eating the fish and the bread and, and Jesus, you know, most theologians believe that Jesus' encounter with Peter had to do with his betrayal. You know, he betrayed Jesus three times and Jesus knew it was going to happen. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Remember the story? Peter says, yeah, yes, I love you. What do you mean, do I love you? And then Jesus asked again, do you love me? And he said, yes, I love you. Why would you ask that? You insult me. You ask me if I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And then he again, he said, do you love me? He said, yes. He said, feed my sheep. So what do you get out of that? Listen, Peter betrayed Jesus. He shouldn't have done that. Jesus knew it was going to happen. And all the disciples fled and Peter literally betrayed him. But at a time like this, Jesus is about to go back to heaven for the last time until his second coming and, and, and the church has got to move forward. And, you know, Peter should have been asking Jesus, do you love me? I'm the one that betrayed you. Do you still love me? What do you mean do I love you? I failed you. I've been kicking myself ever since. I can't live with myself. Yeah, well you, yeah, I love you. That's why it hurts so bad. Don't you understand? And Jesus was saying, yeah, I understand. I understand completely. But nothing on my end has changed. Nothing, nothing. If you still love me, we're still in this. If you still love me, Feed my sheep. If you still love me, do what I've called you to do. If you still love me, I still love you. That's never been in question. I've forgiven you. That was never in question. The only thing that's in question here is, do you love me? And he said, yes, I love you. He said, well, it's set then. Go feed the sheep. Listen, folks, there are sheep out there. There are people out there waiting for you to get over it. 
They're waiting for you and the Lord to make up and get this behind you. You don't have to deal with these things for the rest of your life. Do you love him? Do you still love him? Do you still want to do his will? Do you still have a passion for his plan for your life? Then do it. Because he took care of everything else. The only thing he doesn't supply is your love for him. Isn't that awesome? Jesus didn't say, are you sorry about what you've done? Have you learned something? Are you going to try to do better? Can I put you on probation? Are you going to respect me more? How dare you? No, no, none of that mattered. Because, see, he doesn't want you to fulfill your future, you, his will in your life, because you're sorry about what you've done, because you're trying to pay him back for all your mistakes. That should never be the issue. The only issue has been the only issue. And that is, do you love him? Do you love him? I'm going to feed the sheep because I love him. I'm going to go to all the world because I love him. I'm going to serve God with all my heart because I love him. Not because of what I did wrong. Not because of what I did right. That's all been taken care of. Today, we're free from the past. And we're ready for God's future. Can you say amen to that? That's absolutely the truth. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. No matter what you've been through, God has made it possible for you to be free from your past and excited about your future. In this series, you'll learn how to apply God's word to your past so you can experience joy, unspeakable and full of glory. To order your copy of this series, visit our website, gregfritz.org. Want more good news? Visit our website anytime, gregfritz.org, for more teaching materials. That's gregfritz.org. I hope you've enjoyed the teaching on this program as much as I've enjoyed bringing it to you. And after all we've covered to this point, there's so much more I want to say. And if you like this and you want me to continue bringing these programs to you, you could help me. And you could help me by doing three things. One, you could go to my Facebook page and like us or follow us. That'll give us an instant uh, knowledge that you're out there, instant feedback. And I'd love to know that. Number two, go to our website and check out our products. If you purchase a product, you're going to help me make more programs and it'll be a blessing to you also. And number three, if you were to give us, go to the donate button and give us a one-time gift or, or become a monthly partner. That would go so far in helping me continue to do what I'm doing and take the good news to the world. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing you on the next program. Visit our website, gregfritz.org, and become a partner today. Coming up next on Good News with Greg Fritz. We're supposed to forgive those who have ought against us? Forgive them, no matter what they've done. You forgive them, and then if somebody has an offense against you, you're supposed to go try to make that right. But when all of those things have been done, and you have done everything you know to do, and there's no undoing it, no redoing it, and I'm not talking about divorce now, you need to go to a counselor and fix your marriage. Don't give up on your families. Don't give up on your marriage. Are, is that clear? But when you've done everything you can do with a relationship and it just doesn't work and it's not going to be reconciled, at some point you need to move on.